Hi, everybody, and welcome to today's study and our 40 days of prayer and fasting. We are on day 15, completing three weeks of our study of the book of Matthew, and very excited that you decided to join me for today's study as we get into Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13. We're just going to be looking at the first 23 verses today of Matthew chapter 13. And give me a second here. Ah, first of all, let me say thank you to somebody uh, before I get started. I want to thank my wife for getting up with me every morning. She always gets my coffee for me. I, these uh, little studies are impossible without her, as she is the one who gets me motivated and going, and, and I'm just so grateful for her. So I want to thank Crystal in front of all of you for all of her wonderful help. Thank you, sweetheart. And I want to say good morning to people already joining us. Good morning to Forrest. Good morning to Darlene. If you're joining us, say hi so I can speak back to you. I see a couple, uh, few more pictures of people out there, and I'm so thankful as we get started in chapter 13 of Matthew. Now, Matthew's going to do some interesting things. Hi, Denise. Glad you're with us this morning. Matthew's going to do something in chapter 13 that is a little different, but he continues to maintain prophetic statements from the Old Testament about the Messiah being fulfilled. Hey, good morning, Helen. Glad you're with us. Good morning, Tony. Uh, glad to uh, have you as well. Um, Chapter 13, though, is going to talk specifically about parables. We're going to have a whole chapter based on parables, what they are, how they are effective in Jesus' ministry. And really, at the same time, this also emphasizes the way that Messiah was spoken about in the Old Testament about how he would teach the gospel. As a matter of fact, Psalm 78 talks about I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things hidden since the creation of the world. And so, in a way, uh, we are getting this fulfilled here in Matthew chapter 13. Again, another emphasis by Matthew to the Jewish contemporaries that this is the one we've been waiting for. Hey, good morning, Brenda. Thank you for joining us today also. So let's jump into chapter 13. We're going to get a few passages that are going to deal with prophetic fulfillment, but let's look at the parable itself, and let's sort of break it down a little bit. We have an unusual circumstance, and when Jesus is going to tell a parable and teach a parable, but then he's actually going to explain the parable, which a lot of times you don't get in some of the gospel references to his parables, but it starts verse 1 of chapter 13, that same day, and this must have been the day when people told him about uh, his mother and, and brothers were waiting on him and there was a lot going on. He had cast out demons and, and so forth and done some teaching. But it says that same day Jesus went out of the house and sat by the lake. Such large crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat in it while all the people stood on the shore. So we have Jesus sitting down in a boat and everyone's standing on the shore. I wonder how that would go over today if the pastor sat down and everyone stood up. It'd probably be less people dozing in the sanctuaries. I don't know. It depends on how good the speaker is, I guess. Hey, good morning, Daryl. Good morning, Donnie. Thanks for joining us. What a great group we've got already this morning. So we have Jesus sitting, the people standing on the shore. Now, one advantage to getting in the boat is obviously he can kind of use that as his pulpit. The acoustics on the water probably made it much easier for him to be heard by a multitude. But this is quite controversial because a lot of people believed that the teaching of the kingdom of God should only take place in the synagogue uh, by those learned teachers who are respected in the community. So we have a little controversy in that Jesus is proclaiming the message of the truth here in a boat, in a very um, informal setting on the lake. Verse 3, Then he told them many things in parables, saying, A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns which grew up and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good, gro uh, good soil excuse me, where it produced a crop a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. Whoever has ears 
let them hear. Now, Jesus is not saying, literally, whoever has ears, let them hear. He's saying that whoever is attentive, whoever is curious, whoever wants to have greater insight into the truth, let them hear. Open your eyes, open your minds, open your hearts, and open your ears so that you can understand the depths of this teaching. Hey, good morning, Karen. Thank you for joining us today. So what do we got in this basic story that Jesus breaks down for us, this first parable? We have the seed being sown. We're going to be told in just a minute what that seed represents, but I want you to notice that the seed is the same. It's just sown in four different places. He's addressing probably an agricultural nation at the time. It's a lot of farmers, a lot of shepherds, and so he is trying to identify or get them to identify with this story. Think about the fact, the reality is that we remember stories much better than we remember hard teaching, don't we? And so it's important that illustrations be made. That's something they teach us whenever we're looking into entering the ministry, how important an illustration is. And Jesus does an ideal illustration here so that everyone who is listening can identify with the background of the story, the farmer, and the seed being sown. They understand how by sowing seed it will spring up if things work out right. And if the soil is good. So it's important that really the main part that Jesus wants us to, to distinguish the differences in are the types of soil where the same seed is being sown. He picks up in verse 10. The disciples came to him and asked, Why do you speak to the people in parables? He replied, Because the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven has been given to you, but not to them. Who are them? Well, probably the Pharisees, probably some of those who think they're real experts in the law, and they are failing to comprehend what Jesus is trying to put across. Now, one important, I guess, uh, distinctive feature of a parable is it's really non-threatening until you start to think about it. It's really something that comes across very gently, but penetrates our hearts in a deep way that coming out with just a basic message may not cause us to think and dwell upon the morality of it. So he's saying that the, the kingdom of heaven's secrets are given to the disciples and those who are open to it, but not to them, those who have hard hearts. Whoever has, verse 12, will be given more. So if you dwell on these truths, you're going to learn greater depth of what I'm trying to teach. You will be given more, and they will have an abundance Whoever does not have, those who have hard hearts, even what they have will be taken from them. In other words, if they're dismissing the truth, this is really not going to make a difference, uh, and, and it's going to seem kind of fluffy to them. Hey, good morning, Kelly. Thank you for joining us today as well. Glad to have everybody with us. So verse 13 says, this is why I speak to them in parables. And then we're going to see him do something here, Matthew is going to quote Jesus, quoting Isaiah, to again fulfill he is Messiah. He knows what was spoken of him in days of old. So he quotes Isaiah, Though seeing they do not see, meaning the people who listen who have hard hearts, though hearing they do not hear or understand, in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, you will be ever hearing but never understanding, you will be ever seeing but never perceiving, for this people's heart has become calloused. In some, in some uh, translations, particularly King James, has an odd way of uh, presenting this, but I wanted to read it for you. It says, whenever, uh, by hearing ye shall hear and shall not understand, seeing ye shall see and not perceive, for his people's heart, this people's heart excuse me, is waxed gross and their ears are dull of hearing. And Jesus says it's because these people's heart has become calloused and hardly hear with their ears, and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn, and I would heal them. Right out of Isaiah chapter 6. But Jesus talks about his disciples and those who want to understand. He says, but blessed are your eyes because they see, and your ears because they hear, People can hear just fine. They're not listening. But these disciples are listening, wanting to know the deeper truths. For truly I tell you, many prophets and righteous people, Old Testament prophets, 
long ago prophets and people, generations prior, longed to see what you see, but did not see it, and to hear what you hear, but did not hear it. They knew that Jesus was coming. We've talked about that in our Thursday night studies in the book of Hebrews. You can read upon it about the hall of faith, all these wonderful prophets who saw the day of Christ, who believed it would happen, that God would redeem the people of Israel and those Gentiles who would look to him. But they And they believed it, they lived for it, but they didn't live long enough to see it fulfilled. He's saying, you know, people wanted to see what's happening in your day happen. And here's a quick reference to it again confirming his uh, his godliness, his holiness, and his righteousness, and that he is the son of God that was promised. Verse 18, though, now he's going to literally give a definition of the parable. Very rare for Jesus to do this. Listen, then, to what the parable of the sower means. He's talking to his more intimate disciples. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in their heart. This is the seed sown along the path. These are the ones that, you know, sometimes church gets routine. Sometimes the gospel gets routine. It's been trodden over several times. Our hearts get less receptive to it. And sometimes we get critical of things that have nothing to do with the message. Satan comes and wants to snatch it away. And sometimes it's the, the person who shows a little interest but not really uh, not a, de a depth of any interest in growing spiritually, Satan is able to take the seed away from them. It's the same seed that can sprout incredible growth, but for these people, it never gets into their hearts and it never gets into, uh, there's no reflection of it in their life. So that's the seed that is sown along the path, Jesus says. Verse 20, the seed falling on rocky ground refers to someone who hears the word and at once receives it with joy but since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. You ever known that person who just seems on fire as a disciple of Christ one day? It's just out of the blue, something happened in their life. They decided to get serious about their spiritual life. They start, oh, I can't get enough. Pastor, let me write this down. Or they start proclaiming the gospel on Facebook or social media. They're so gung-ho, they want to testify. But then it seems like, Three weeks down the road, they're gone. They're not in church anymore. They're certainly not following. They're not, you know, to, there's no indication that they're continuing to deepen in their Christian walk. They were on fire at one time, but it burned out very quickly. Why? Because the land was very shallow where the seed was sown, and they sprouted quickly, but then it burned up. And when trial, tribulation, persecution arose because of the name, when they were challenged in their faith, they didn't stand up under the heat, and they withered away. Then verse 22, the seed falling among the thorns refers to someone who hears the word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word, making it unfruitful. I think that's probably the most frightening group because I think we fall into that category a lot as believers. We tend to take the Bible, take the gospel, and don't deny it, believe it totally. And yet so many things catch our attention and draw us away. And it chokes the life out of our spiritual discipleship. We just are not growing like we should be. We're not continuing to get to know Jesus more intimately and deeper in the passing of time. Instead, what happens is we neglect more and more time in his word and with him. And we start to think about our retirement more. We start to think about getting away from it all more. Uh, building up uh, our, you know, the, our autumn years, and or we spend a lot of time, and it's not necessarily bad things. It's just things that choke us. We spend more and more time away from the gospel, more and more time away from our churches and our our uh, times and uh, devotional time. Uh, maybe it's with grandchildren. Maybe it's with the spouse. Maybe it's you know we have time and money enough to get away. We and so we get further away and it chokes it away from us. We don't deny its truth or its relevance. It's just we're preoccupied with too much of what this world has to offer. I think that's a very dangerous slope. But then we have verse 23. But the seed falling on good soil refers to someone who hears the word and understands it, really understands what it's all about. It changes them. This is the one who produces a crop yielding 160 or 30 times what was sown.
God can use this person as fertile ground, not only to continue to sow more depth into their life spiritually, but he realizes also they're going to be a channel that continues to sow the gospel more and more and more wherever they go in their lives and who, with whomever they encounter. Tremendous start to this chapter, and we will conclude this chapter, Lord willing, in our next study. I want to thank you so much for joining me today as we looked into God's Word, and I want to continue to pray that we will be changed by spending some time these 40 days in the book of Matthew. Hey, our prayer need for every Friday as we study the Word is for our Sunday services. So if you're part of our congregation, let's pray for our Sunday services. If you're part of another congregation, I want to be praying for your Sunday services as well. If you can be in church this weekend, please do support your pastor, support the ministry of the church, and be there with an open heart and ears that hear so that the gospel can be sown into your life. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for the time we've shared with you today, your blessing upon our gathering, and we thank you for the word of God. We pray you would truly sow the seed in our lives in such a way that we are channels to help to grow a large crop, 160, 30-fold, whatever it might be. Let us not just take the seed and let it sprout in our lives, uh, but let us take the, the seed, let it sprout, and continue to sow seed in the community with those we love, with whom we're praying for. Help us, Father, with all we encounter to, to represent Christ in such a way that we're able to sow seed in our community. The gospel doesn't change. Our process sometimes need to. Help us to get deeper into the word. And Lord, we pray that we will begin doing that with being in church on Sunday. We pray for power in our pulpits. We pray that the message will be delivered in all of its truthfulness, that it will be direct, and that it will change us and help us to be more Christ-like. Forgive us where we fail. Help people, Lord, to hear and to truly understand the gospel, what it's all about and what it means. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you again for joining me today. We'll be back beginning on Monday, Monday through Friday, as we pick up with this study in this same chapter. God bless you. Have a wonderful weekend, everyone. I hope to see many of you in church on Sunday.